<clears throat> so, who are Mrs. Alexander? And uh, rabbis, and all of you uh, special souls, uh, thank you for the honor to, um, to try to humbly pay tribute to uh, Yossi. I was listening to the proceedings here online, so it's working. And uh, your moving words. And what can you say you know, about um, a loss and tragedy? And yet, uh, as the Rebbe taught us, in the words of the Friedrich Rebbe, that uh, it may be very difficult to speak, but it's even more difficult to be silent. So hearing that the yard side is uh, Yeralef Kislev, right? So as soon as you hear that date, you immediately think of this month, which is uh, full of special days, Yud Kislev, Tes Kislev, Yedalet Kislev, the Rebbe's anniversary, and then, of course, your Tes Kislev and Hanukkah. So being that just tomorrow will be the Rebbe's anniversary, and it's in proximity with uh, the yard side here, I want to share with you a story. It's a story that very few people know, but I heard it from the person involved. <clears throat> I think it's very appropriate as I'll explain shortly. And the story is about a uh, young man who was in his uh, late teens, I think approximately 17 or 18. And these were the years when um, people were able to go into Yechidus and have a private audience with the Rebbe. So later years, the Rebbe made it very clear that he's not depriving anyone, but it was through Fabrengen, through collective Yechidus, but he had a one-on-one -on -one with the Rebbe. And he's, a, he's an individual that suffered greatly in many ways. First of all, he had a loss of a parent who died at a young age in an accident. And uh, essentially was thrown from one home to the next where nobody wanted him. And got himself into a lot of trouble. On many different levels. So he was by the Rebbe. And... Uh, encouraged by some people to go into the Rebbe. The Rebbe is your father, he's your friend, many things. And pour out your heart and soul. What better place to, uh, to speak to someone than the Rebbe himself. And that's what he did. And he was told by people who, who knew the situation, don't hesitate, don't, no filters. Say everything, exactly what's on your heart. Don't be, try to be respectful or... or uh, Censor yourself. So that's what he did. He began to cry in front of the Rebbe. I heard the story later from him. And the Rebbe was very, of course, patient and very caring and loving. And listened closely to his old story. And, uh, and the Rebbe said to him the following words. He said that um, for every challenge God gives somebody, he always gives him also an equal amount of strength to deal with it. So though these challenges that you describe are, are great, but you have to know you have special strengths that came along. And though it doesn't justify what happened in your life, but it would be tragic if you didn't access the strengths that you also have and your potential. And Rebbe went on and said that in the mysteries of God's creation, God leads the footsteps of people in many different directions. And sometimes we go through bizarre twists and turns. And even that is for a purpose. Because you have to remember that every situation, any experience that you have, you are sent to that situation because you can do something that only you can accomplish. And no one else but you can accomplish. And this includes even difficult situations. And the Rebbe told him briefly the story of um, Chaim Rappaport, who was a great tzaddik himself, but he was one of the students and colleagues of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov once sent him on a mission. And when he came back and fulfilled the mission, the Baal Shem Tov 
thanked him, but then asked him a seemingly odd question. How did you travel? How did you get there? So Chaim, you know, even though it may seem, who really cares which you went this way or that way, the Baal wants to know, so he began to share. The Baal wanted every detail. Every detail. Which city did you travel through? Where did you rest? Where did you sleep over? So he told them the first night he slept, slept in an inn. The second night, there was no inn, so he slept on the side of a road. And in the morning he woke up, washed his hands, said his prayers, and then sat down to have something to eat. And, and, the, and then he saw a brook of water, a spring of water, where he went over and, and took a cup of water, and made a blessing, Baruch Atah Hashem L'Kein Melech HaElam, Shehakel Niyeh Bidvarei, and drank the cup. The Baal Tov jumped up with Simcha, with joy, and said that that spring of water, that brook of water was waiting from the beginning of time for you to come there and make a blessing on it. Now think of the story. That means every, every experience, the entire existence is waiting for you to come there and achieve something. And the Rebbe told this to this young boy and said, so whatever experience you have, that experience is waiting for you to do something, to use the special strengths that you were given. And then the Rebbe finally said the final thing, which was, remember also that I am always with you. No matter where you go on your journeys, I'm always with you, and I think about you. So if you think about me, and I think about you, you'll be able to accomplish everything you need to accomplish. So you can imagine, he was quite overwhelmed. Frankly, he said he didn't even understand half of what the Rebbe said. He remembered it, but he didn't understand the significance until years later. We're talking now, almost 35, 40 years later. Due to his own confidentiality, I can't say his name, but he's a success story today. And it all began right that little Yechidus of a father, a Rebbe, speaking to his child in this personal way. I was thinking about it. You know, the Rebbe's words, I think about you. So if you ever read Lekutet de Burim, which is talks of the Friedrich Rebbe, is a beautiful, unbelievable, poetic piece right in the beginning of Lekutet de Burim, literally the first pages. And the Friedrich Rebbe says something very interesting. He says that when you have a friend in a friendship, there are five levels of how you express friendship. One higher than the next. The lowest level, the first level is what's called Shalom Aleichem. You see your friend, you welcome him, you greet him, shake his hand. Friedrich Rebbe says there almost sarcastically, sometimes when you shake someone's hand, it means you're welcoming him, but also sometimes say, have a good day, I, I saw you, enough of you. So it is a, a greeting, but it's not the closest relationship. It's a connection. The second level is when two people have a, uh, they embrace each other. They hug and embrace each other. So that goes beyond words. It shows an expression of real care, real concern, real, right, like that. There you go. Cameras. Want to do it again? Okay. That's only level two. Now, level number three is having a conversation. Okay. Don't push it, right? Don't push it. Oh, we're going to go all the way? Good. Okay. Level number three is when you have a conversation. So it's not just Shalom Aleichem and not just a hug. You actually sit and talk to each other. And I don't mean talk about the weather or something superficial. A serious conversation, heart to heart, eye to eye. And that's still, that's only level number three. Number number four is staring at each other. You just look at each other. Sometimes you see people who really care about each other. They can just say, they, they, it doesn't, they're not awkward to be quiet. And that's even deeper than a conversation. They say when the Rebbe reunited with his mother, the Rebbe Tzachana, after, what can we say, Tav Shin Zayin, at least uh, 30 years that he didn't see her, probably more. So it was in Paris, it was in the year 1947, the Rebbe was the only time he, after he came to America, went back to France to greet her and bring her back to the United States. So the people, eyewitnesses saw that when they met, they embraced for 20 minutes and just looked at each other without saying a word. Because there's some things that are beyond words. So that's level number four. But what's number five? What's higher than that? 
So the Friedrich Rebbe says, Machshove, when you think about your friend, even if you can't see him. I was in Russia under the Russian uh, oppression. And the Friedrich Rebbe says, and where are you now? You're here. He says, because somebody thought about you. You know, basically the Friedrich Rebbe is saying that I thought about you, that's why you're here. So don't say thought doesn't matter. If it would have been the first four levels, the Friedrich Rebbe couldn't have done anything because he wasn't there with him physically. He couldn't give him a shalom aleichem or, cover, or hug or conversation or stare at him. But a thought transcends time and space. This is the beginning of the Kutta de Burm. It's a very fascinating thing to, to read, to see you know, the, how a Rebbe and how Chassidim, what means Chassidim are connected. So we're here right now and we cannot see the Neshama of course, not the body of Yosef. However, never think just because we can't see him doesn't mean he can't see us. And just like we can't see the Rebbe doesn't mean he can't see us. Machshava, the Rebbe said to that boy back in the late 60s when it happened, the story I just told, I think about you and you think about me and we'll be connected. So we don't know who's thinking about us because we can't always feel it. But don't ever think there isn't someone thinking. And if you wanted to become aware of it, you have to think about the one who's thinking about you. So I wanted to just open up with those few words because I think it captures very much, first of all, why we're here. And in a way, each of you in your own story. I don't know you all. I know some of you by face. We met at my Shabbos table a few times. But I know one thing for sure. Every one of you has a bizarre journey, to say the least. And, and frankly, everybody on earth has one, especially in our day and age. So you can look at it as overwhelming, as disturbing, as depressing, or whatever. Or you can look at it as the Rebbe said, that every journey comes with its strengths. And just imagine, it's true, there are many things that happen in your life, in my life, in everyone's life, maybe we would rather it didn't happen. But after the fact, you have two choices. Either you just become demoralized and broken by it, and bitter, or you recognize that you were put there because you can achieve something that Shesh Yisim gracious from the beginning of time. That experience, that encounter is waiting for you, each of you in your own way, to come and do something. And particularly the challenges that you may have open you up to different opportunities that others would never have. And that Yechid is that the Rebbe, that young man, I believe is the Yechid is that each one of you could have right now with the Rebbe, each one of us, because we're here right now, we have our challenges, we have our encounters, and we have a Rebbe that thinks about us. And we have other chassidim, and we have friends that think about us. And the thought, when it's a true thought, we're not talking here just some casual thought, but you really care and think about someone. There was a guy who went by dollars and said to the Rebbe that my son is gone who knows where, and I want the Rebbe to help me save him. So the Rebbe said... Halavai, may it be that he should think about me as much as I think about him. Again, the same thing, thought. The thought. Because when you think about someone you love, there's some energy that that generates and has an impact. So though it's three years, I did not have the schus to know Yossi, maybe I may have met him, I don't recall. So those three years, and it's three sad years, and as a mother, as you are so... Uh, accurately said, no one can ever understand the pain of a mother in such a situation. But you have to remember that though we may never understand the mysteries, the Neshama lives on, the Neshama sees us and sees you, and sees all the energy and the efforts that you invested, and the seeds you planted. And there will be fruits, and there are fruits. Besides our gathering together, all the achlotas and resolutions Thought, the thought of a Rebbe, the thought of friends for each other. There's a story they tell about, talk about friends, again with the Rebbe, that somebody um, who uh, was uh, living in the Midwest, I'm not sure which city, but he was told by the Shliach there that when he comes to New York, he should make sure to go make an appointment and see the Rebbe. Okay, he had no idea why, but he was told by the guy, he respected him, he said, okay, let me do that. Comes to New York, goes into the 770, or calls, makes an appointment, and they gave him an appointment one of the next few days. He was here for a few weeks, 
Okay. Comes into the Rebbe. His appointed time, always a little later usually, sometime early, uh, like after midnight. The Rebbe offers him a seat. He sits down. And, uh, the, and he's quiet. And the Rebbe says to him, you know, is there anything I can help you with? So he said, not really. He said, why are you here? He said, because uh, this and this rabbi told me I'd make you come to New York. I must come see you. Now that I'm sitting here, I'm actually wondering myself why I'm here. So the Rebbe said, you know, I'm not comfortable with someone being here who may not want to be here. But since you're here already and everything is divine providence, maybe you have something on your mind that you'd like to talk about. So he said, yeah, why don't you tell me? I mean, he had the chutzpah, I mean, of a regular guy. Why don't you tell me, why am I here? Why, why, what's so special about you that the guy said, I have to see you? Why do people value you so much? I saw a whole line outside and people, you could see they, they, uh, they uh, uh, I don't know the word, as they said, worship, they admire you. So the Rebbe smiled and said, I can't speak for them, but I could say, I, what I try to do is be a friend to everyone I meet. So the guy began to chuckle and say, a friend? What's so big about that? I have a lot of friends. So the Rebbe said, let me define what a friend is, and then you'll tell me how many friends you have. And the Rebbe said, a friend, a true friend is the following. A true friend is someone that you could speak to without any defenses up, without any hesitation, without fear of judgment, without fear of being criticized, heart to heart, as if you speak to yourself. That's a friend. So then the Rebbe looked at him and said, so tell me, how many friends like that do you have? He said, I don't have any such friends. I even wonder whether there is such a there is possibility to have such a friend. So the Rebbe again said to him, I try to be such a friend to people. In simple words, the Rebbe told him the essence of what a Rebbe is, just a friend. But you know, we use the word friend so much today, people have thousands of Facebook friends and all kinds of other friends, that it's meaningless. You know, most of these friends are not friends at all, but it's a, it's a word. United Airlines, friendly skies, you know. It's a, uh, an advertising gimmick. That's why it's important sometimes to step back and say, okay, what's a real friend? So how many of you can say you have a friend like this by a show of hands? Anybody? One person? The whole world? A friend the way I described it now? Okay, that's good to hear. That means you have to make sure by next year that everybody raises their hands. No, I, I mean not forcing them to raise that they actually have that time. Now, I understand the answer is very simple. As, 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 as great as Rabbi Meshav Veglin and as great as uh, <laughs> Rabbi Shem Tev is, they're not the Rebbe, right? However, the Rebbe gave us power to try to be friends like that to people. It's a great gift to be able to have someone you can speak to who you know you can just speak to without any hesitation, without fear of judgment, as I said, and all the other stuff. Because there's just something about being um, validated, being reinforced. I'm sure if we went through, we turned this into a group therapy session, everybody could talk about their nightmares, about how no, no friends you had as you grew up. Sometimes our own families are not, not only not friends, they can be enemies. But definitely not an opportunity where you could just sit and speak to someone and t- talk, speak your heart. Whatever age that is. It's the greatest blessing. You know, I speak to many parents. And they always ask me, like, you know, advice, what could you do? I said, what could you do? It comes down to something very simple, what you could do. Just be there. There's no gimmicks. You don't need to buy another video machine or take your child for another vacation. Even those are all nice things. But if you don't give a child your attention, and you don't give your child a simple... Love, unconditional love of just that they can speak without fear, without... Am I saying anything that's uh, offending anybody? (laughs) Or you guys are just uh, not interested? Uh, (laughs) uh, uh, (laughs) I know know ADHD is contagious, I know that. And uh, if you sit with one person, ADHD, everybody seems to get it. But anyway, I'm just trying to share a few words, and I hope uh, I'm saying words from the heart. So, 
That doesn't mean even if you had a situation where you did not have someone to speak to, it doesn't mean you can't find such a friend. Because there are true people and there are sincere people and they're real people. So, with that said, I think one of the most important messages, especially as we're here tonight to honor on the Shama that was torn away far, far too prematurely. So even if you don't do it for yourself, sometimes honoring someone who right now cannot physically continue his shlichus, his mission in this world, it's so every one of you who knew Yossi, or who's here, and even if you didn't know him, but we're here together because of him, has a real obligation. You have to, in a way, be the arms and legs in helping fulfill the, the reason we're here and his inspiration. And exactly as I said before, every one of you has a unique situation. And unique may be a strange word, but unique could be something even extremely difficult. But you have to always remember that from the beginning of time, the whole big plan was waiting for you to come to that situation and do something positive about it. And when you do that, you change the whole course of history. Literally. I want to share with you a, a story, one of the most definitive experiences that happened with me a number of years ago. Well, it's actually still happening, but it started a, few, a number of years ago. And that is this. When my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, was published, which was initially uh, 1995, so it would be around 20 years ago. Yeah, time flies. I'm just, I was a younger man then, what can I say? Um, as we all were. Any of you were not born yet? Anybody here under 20? Huh? No. Okay, good. How many copies you all look young to me. Huh? How many copies were sold? How many you want me to like, give a plug? <laughs> okay, announcement from our sponsor. Uh, how many copies? Well, in English, around a half a million, and with other languages, uh, 13 languages, uh, maybe a million total. There you go. Ah, I, should, I should have started with this. Now, you'll, now I got your attention. I understand. Celebrities get attention. Till now, I was talking like a humble chassid. Now I started talking about my author. Uh... No, I understand. I understand. Yeah, but what's a million among seven billion people? Let's put it this way. So it's a long way to go. And I want to bless you all. Maybe you have a book inside of you. They say, yeah. Or another a poem or a song. So Thoreau, the great writer, once wrote that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And there's a second half to that statement, which is attributed to him, but it's pretty sad. And they die with their song still inside them. So I'm blessing you right now that, you should, that not only... <laughs> that you should uh, make sure to sing your song. Because everybody here has a unique voice and a powerful, indispensable contribution to make. And now back to the story. So when my book was published, they sent me on a, uh, the book publisher, William Morrow, today Harper Collins, they sent me on a book tour. <coughs> you know what a book tour is called? Book signings. And you travel from city to city, bookstores like Barnes & Noble and other stores like that, and uh, there's a, an evening is scheduled where you speak, and then you sign books, and that's that. Before I tell this story, I'll tell the story before this story, because it's a good introduction. So in this journey that I took was also a bizarre journey, because you meet in bookstores people that will not come even to Aliyah. How do you like that? And they won't come to Chabad House, and they won't come to Shul, they won't come to any Jewish environment. But in a bookstore, completely non-threatening. Someone may go there to buy an order repair manual or just sitting with a, for a coffee. And there I am speaking. So people drove, came over. And I met, I mean, I, I wrote all the stories down, actually fascinating interactions with all kinds of interesting people. As I said, people you don't meet in a regular setting because it's not like planned. And of course, the greatest magic happens in times like that. So the story before the story is I was in Lexington, Kentucky, just to show you the Amuna of non-Jews stronger than the, those of Jews, sadly. So Lexington, Kentucky, is a, a city where there are less Jews there than those sitting in the room here. Atka de Kach, to the extent there's no Chabad yet in Lexington. There's a Chabad in Louisville, Kentucky. So if you look in the Shlichus position, maybe that's an opening there. You know, there's one Jew. Um, so Louisville, Kentucky is very famous, known for the Kentucky Derby, right? Kentucky Fried Chicken, 
kosher style. By the way, there they don't call it Kentucky Fried Chicken, there they call it New York Fried Chicken. <laughs> because no one would buy it, everyone's a local. You know, you always call it by a name. Tiny to me, they ain't a time. Okay, that's a derechag. So I come there in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a private, called, with a private uh, bookstore called Joseph Beth. Just in case you're interested, uh, it happens to be the Cincinnati Airport happens to be in Kentucky. This information may or may not be important to you. Um, there's a website called uselessinformation.com, by the way. It happens to have a joke. It's great stuff there, but it's completely useless. You know. So this, is, this fits into that category. So I come there, and Joseph is the place in Lexington. And I come to the, the counter, and I tell the, the person standing there, the, the attendant, that I'm here to sign some books. What's the name of your book? Toward a Meaningful Life. So she looks it up on the computer, and suddenly I see her whole face and complexion change. Her whole personality becomes all like disturbed. I don't know why, but, you know, I didn't do anything. And then she gets on the phone, she picks up the phone and whispers, I shouldn't hear, but I did hear. She whispers, the, Reb, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is back. <laughs> I kid you not, it's a true story. You could just put it down. Because you see, the cover of the book is Toward a Meaningful Life, The Wisdom of the Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneers. And my name is on the bottom in small words, by Simon Jacobs. That's what she says. So the, tent, the, the manager... The manager comes running downstairs. So, I kid you not. The manager comes running downstairs. And, uh, and they're both like, you know, catering to me. You want a coffee, Rabbi? We'll call CNN. We'll this, sit down, be comfortable. So you know what? How often do you have opportunity to play, Rabbi? So I decided I'll play along. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you never told me this. <laughs> okay, now you hear it. You have to come to Aliyah to hear Zach Aliyah Dikamaisis. Yeah. Anyway, so... <laughs> I'm sitting, I'm, they're sitting there, I'm wondering why they think the Rebbe of all places would make an appearance in Lexington, Kentucky, you know. And is that the first thing you'd like to have a coffee? Anyway, after a few minutes, I felt bad, and I just said, listen, what can I tell you? I really apologize, and I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not the Rebbe. <laughs> I'm, 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 I work for him. My name is Simon Jacobson. And they were visibly disappointed. Now, you know from the story that they were definitely not Jews, right? Because no Jews would ever believe that, unfortunately. Uh, it takes a uh, and that's a story that just introduction to another story which is far more serious and I was in St. Louis that's Lexington I was in St. Louis, Missouri this is the Midwest, Missouri okay um, I spoke there I remember it was a Monday night there's a JCC Jewish Community Center there um, after I got back to New York I received a letter an email from a woman and she writes this uh, letter had such impact on me, I remember it word for word, so I'll read it to you from memory. She uh, writes the following, she said, I was in the audience when you spoke in St. Louis, I was going to come over to speak with you, but then I had cold feet, so I decided I'd better put it in writing. And this is what she writes. I'm a 47-year-old executive that uh, works in a, in a very prominent firm here in uh, St. Louis, and by all standards, I'm a success story. I made a lot of money. I'm well connected, with good reputation, and so on. But, but beneath the veneer, beneath the surface of my success lies a woman in shreds. You see, because my soul was murdered when I was a young child. My soul was murdered due to the abuse that I endured in my home, physical, emotional, sexual abuse. And they, live so, they, they, they murdered my soul. And more than murdered. Well, murder is once. This is every day another murder. And my life has been a total mess. Relationships are a mess. Intimacy is a mess. I don't trust anyone. They don't trust me. I'm always testing people. Testing, testing, testing. Until I chase them away. I've tried all types of therapy. That has also not worked. And basically I just go day by day. Breathe in, breathe out, and take another day. I have suicidal thoughts. I have uh, I self-loathing. And what do people like me do when they have a loss of inner control? You create outer control. So I became very ambitious, I'm very driven, I'm successful, I'm aggressive. But it's just a facade, just to cover up and numb my pain. And I've long given up hope. 
Someone gave me a copy of your book, Torah, Meaningful Life. I'm Jewish, but non-affiliated. I never went to any synagogue. And I wasn't even going to read the book, but I was browsing through it. Like, you know, you look through, leaf through the pages. And a line jumped out at me that like struck me like a silver bullet between my eyes. And it touched a deep chord inside my soul. And that line was, because the beginning of each chapter is a line that I quote the Rebbe. So the line she quotes, she says, the line is, birth is God saying that you matter. And she writes again, birth is God saying that you matter. And writes a third time, birth is God saying you matter. And I will read this line, she continues writing, for the rest of my life. Because I suddenly, for some reason, after 47 years, a truth resonated within me that despite what my parents told me that I was worthless, piece of junk, despite what society tells us that we are no, our value is nothing more than the statistic on someone's balance sheet and that our value is based on our productivity, on our buying power, on our youth, on our looks, on our equity, on our social status, Despite all that, I matter to the one that matters most. And that's God. That God chose me, put me on this earth. And this is how she concludes the note. It would be eloquent if it weren't under the circumstances. She writes, So though I have many years to heal, but for the first time in my life I have hope. I have to, the work cut out for me is the following, is to bypass the infected arteries that were corrupted and polluted by the abuse I endured and reconnect to the pure moment of birth, the moment I came into this world before anything happened to me, when God said, you're my child, I need you, you're indispensable, you matter. And then she concludes by saying, so thank you for giving me back my life. That's the letter. Now you can imagine, and I read it, I literally began to cry almost uncontrollably. You know, first of all, a woman sharing a sacred trust like that with me. I didn't know her, she didn't know me. And frankly, what I did was I went back to the book. You know, even though I wrote the book, but sometimes, you know, a book doesn't belong to the author once it's published. It belongs to the reader. So I wanted to see how she read it. And I went back and began crying again because I saw the line, I remember when I wrote it, and I remember this was a line that even though the Rebbe didn't say it in English, but it was a line that was repeated many times by the Rebbe and always with very deep emotion. It's actually based on a Pasuk in Yeshaya. The Rebbe spoke especially by rallies of Tzivus Hashem. Any of you ever been by any of those rallies? Especially, what was it? The Pasuk, Kol Yisrael Yeshlam Chelek Leilam Havu, that's the Maimach. Then it says, Shenema, right? Neitzah Matoi, Maisi Yodel Yispoir. Amach Kun, Tzadikim, Neitzah Matoi, you're my handiwork. Maisi Yodel Yispoir, you're the handy, you're my, my uh, crafts work that I am proud of. And very often when the Rebbe would quote it, he would say those words. He'd say that every one of you and every individual matters absolutely because the fact that you're here, you're not here by accident. You're put here. You have something to accomplish that no one on earth, and the Rebbe said this a number of times, not Moshe Rabbeinu, not Avram, and not Sarah Rivka Rachuleya, and not all the tzaddikim and tzaddikim, all of history, no one can accomplish what you have to accomplish. I heard this number several times from the Rebbe myself. So I wanted to capture it, and that was the chapter on birth in Toward a Meaningful Life, and that line. And here's a woman in St. Louis, which was at that time, two, three years after Gimel Thomas, touched and said, writing, thank you for giving me back my life. So you can imagine the power of that. What's the power of that? Because it means something to each of us. Now I wrote back to that woman, of course, offering her my friendship, any way I could help, asking her permission to tell the story, which she gave me, and she told me clearly never to tell her name. She doesn't want people calling her. She says, I'm sure others have similar stories. Or oh, they'll call me, they want to be, offer their, their compassion. And she still works on herself, but I wouldn't touch. And I've written to her a number of times. A while later, a few years later, the story never leaves me. I, it haunts me till this day. I wrote to her a few years later. I wrote back to her once among a different correspondence. I wrote to her, you know, I want to thank you from the depth of my heart because I have to tell you that since you've given me permission, I've told the story to many people, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. 
and the reaction has been unbelievable. They still want to contact you, so I'm sure you don't want that, so I assure you I won't share your name. But I wrote to her the following, that I started asking myself the question, do I matter? And I started asking audiences, and I speak, I speak quite often in different places. I was just in Manchester, England, I came back yesterday, and I, I told the story, there was a few five, six hundred people, and I asked the question as I ask everyone here right now, do you think you matter? Really matter? Now, the re- knee-jerk reaction many people have that it's like a ridiculous question. Of course I matter. You know, my, my parents say I'm special, hopefully. Um, you know, I have a plaque on the wall. I, I have this. Everyone's got an ego. Obviously, not everyone answers that, but many people, that's their... So, but then the question has to be rephrased. Let's say you were never born in the first place. Remember, if you weren't born and you don't arrive in this world, nobody's missing you, so it won't be a tragedy. So do you really matter? Do you matter? Seven billion people on this planet, would it make a difference if you didn't exist? So most of us, and again, I can't speak for you, I speak for many people, you know, once we're here, it's called circumstantial value. We have value. Once we're here, we justify our existence. But this woman in St. Louis, as others, unfortunately, did not have the luxury of having parents and a family and friends that reinforce that type of value. She was told she was worthless, more than told. She was treated like she was worthless. But she came to a truth that only a person that come like that, that goes through such darkness can come to. You know, they say the eclipse of the sun. When the sun is blocked, it turns dark. I don't know if you've ever seen a solar eclipse. But through a solar eclipse, when it's covered, that's when you see the most powerful light of the sun. That's why it's dangerous to look at the sun at that time. So she was an eclipse. Her life was, was hell. She grew up in a home where as she, her soul was murdered, as she put it. But as a result, she came to a truth that only people like that come to. That re, you really matter, not because your parents tell you you matter. Because, you know, one day, my parents, I'm, I was the uh, oldest of five children. And my parents, were, I guess they spoiled me. You could ask my siblings. They probably have to go to therapy because of me. Not the other way around, you know because you're like a surrogate older brother. If any of you are oldest, you know what I mean. If you're not, you also know what I mean. Um, so, so my parents spoil me, and you know. So, I, so if I matter because my parents say I matter, then one day they wake up and they say, you're not so special. Do your stocks go down? Your value goes down. This woman came to the ultimate truth, which is stated right in the Chumash, right in the beginning. That because God put you on this earth, nobody can take that away from you because no one gave it to you. Remember that. You absolutely matter because God put you here. Now, it would be great if you had family and you have parents and you have friends and others that reinforce that, that uh, validate that, that nurture that. But that doesn't mean that the, the value comes from them. And frankly, if they don't offer that, tragically, it sometimes can create the delusion that you really don't matter. That's why I believe the Rebbe told that boy in Yechidus, and I'm convinced we all know when the Rebbe tells one person something, even though many of us may not have had this chus to go into the Rebbe's room, but when you hear the story, it's as the Rebbe is telling it to you right now, the same thing. That the Rebbe established for the record, he said, you are absolutely valuable. Wherever you go in the world, you have all the strengths you need, even the greatest challenges. The whole existence is waiting for you to do something. And remember, I'm thinking about you. Why? Because the Rebbe thinks about the whole picture, like a choreographer like a conductor of a symphony. You have to know each player, what they're doing. And each of us is a musical note that's indispensable. And if you don't play your note, the rest of the existence cannot be complete. And then, of course, you need to know that everyone else has a note that you need as well to complement you. That's the story with the St. Louis woman. Think about it. Birth is God saying that you matter. Now we have to find ways to do something about that and make sure that it becomes a reality in our lives on a daily basis. Because it's a nice theory, it's nice words. But then you have to do something and demonstrate what you can contribute. And when you do that, then you really change existence. So there's no question coming here together. On one hand, is a sadness in any yard site, especially of a young life. But remember, in Judaism, every sadness is turned into positive energy. The Rebbe once wrote to a doctor who writes to the Rebbe about a Holocaust, about the Holocaust. You know, the famous question, why? Why would God do this? Allow it. 
And this is a unique letter. If any of you want to see it, I have a copy of it. It's not around so much. I could send it to you by email if you send me your email. Did you ask something? No, not Viktor Frankl. There are more doctors on earth than one. But, uh, yeah. hmm? So this doctor writes to the Rebbe, saying, asking why, and the Rebbe's response is basically that if God wanted us to know why, he would tell us. The fact that he doesn't tell us means that's not important for our moving forward with our lives. And the Rebbe elaborates on this at length. And then at the end of the letter, this is the unique part. The Rebbe says, you may think that I'm writing to you intellectually. You know, giving you some type of intellectual, Torah, academic answer. It's not the case. I too am a Holocaust survivor. The Rebbe's words. I lost my brother. I lost my grandmother. I lost my sister-in-law and brother-in-law. And other family members in Treblinka and other camps. So I'm writing from my heart, not from my mind. That's what the Rebbe concludes. There's a lot of strength when you hear that from a Rebbe because you think a Rebbe is living up in the spiritual world. So of course for the Rebbe, there's no pain. But we are regular mortal people. We do have pain. It's not the case. When my father passed away around 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, you know where I gathered strength most from? Because I remembered, because I had this chus to write and remember and, and publish the Rebbe's works. So when the Rebbe's Rebbe Chaim Mushke, the Rebbe Chaim Mushke, was nostalgic, passed away, Chav Be'i Shvat, 1988, Tav as opposed to when the Rebbe's mother passed away in 1964, the Rebbe visibly showed his grief, if you can call it that. When the Rebbe Tzachana passed away, I heard from people, I was a kid then, I don't remember it so vividly, that the Rebbe was very discreet and quiet about it. I mean, he spoke about it, but it was not... In, in 1988, on the other hand, in every possible way, the Rebbe showed his, his pain. He spoke about it, every fabring of Achayit Neliboy, the living shall take to heart. He moved his whole operation from 770 to President Street, where his house, for an entire year. It couldn't have been more visible. Said every day, David every day, three times a day, even though Allah didn't have to. And on and on and on. There's many more examples of it. And I always wondered why the Rebbe, who's so private, especially regarding the Rebbe, excuse me, why would the Rebbe so visibly Show it. I remember even Shleishim. The Shleishim when the Rebetzin, which was 30 days after Chavei Shvat, was Pasha Parah. And the Rebbe spoke this Sikha, very, very heart-wrenching. And he asked the question. In Pasha Parah we read, HaMesh Rabbeinu Shon, the Medrash tells us, HaMesh Rabbeinu Shon, all the tumas, all the impurities that exist. And Hashem showed him, every impurity, here's, the, here's how you purify and it came to one thing, Tumas Mes, the impurity of death. Suddenly it says, Niskarkam upon Hashemesh. Hashemesh's face became very yellowish green, like very disturbed, very pale. And he began to tremble. Bamete Tarase. How could you ever cleanse and purify from the impurity of death? And I remember the Rebbe saying, I remember it like today. The Rebbe asked him the question, What bothered Moshe Rabbeinu? Just like God gives, God takes, and God, just like this, the impurity of death, God can create the purity that comes, that, that heals from death. And Moshe Rabbeinu definitely knew he was Chochmah de Kedusha, Chochmah de Atzilus, the wisest. He definitely knew all the explanations in Chesidus. As soon as the Rebbe said that, it was very clear he was talking about himself. He knew all the explanations in Chesidus that you read at Tzedek Chalia, every descent brings an ascent, and we don't understand God's ways. And all the explanations. And yet, why did he, was he so disturbed? And the Rebbe's answer was equally dramatic. The Rebbe's responded, because after all the seichel, and after all the intelligence, and all the beautiful explanations, quote-unquote beautiful, the fact of the matter is, death is a cutoff. Even though the neshama lives on, the fact that we cannot see it, Moshe Rabbein, that's what disturbed him, because he empathized. He wasn't talking theoretically what's possible. He was talking about the pain that we human beings on this earth do not feel and cannot touch and cannot shake the hand and not embrace and not look at the person we love. We could only think about them. That's what broke his heart. So Moshe wasn't just, uh, it wasn't a technical thing for him. It was personal. And because he cried for it, he identified with our crying. 
I remember when that, that sikha, I said to myself, the Rebbe should say that. It's very rare the Rebbe should expose such emotion. It was just not the Rebbe's style, so to speak. So I have no doubt, I'm sure there's all kinds of reasons, but I have no doubt the Rebbe was giving strength for anyone that would ever have to cry. And anyone that would ever have to go through such a painful moment, that they should know that it's not just mortal people like us who just who cry, but even Rebbe's cry. And even Amish Rabbeinu trembles. That we're there, he's there with us. The Rebbe is with you, not just in good times, but also in challenging times. I don't know who said this, but they say about a Rebbe that he once told someone who had a great loss, you know, I have no answers for you, but I can cry with you. Don't ever underestimate that power, because there's a connection there. So, what shall we say? We'll say this, as the basin of the Kutta de Burim and the Rebbe's words, the thought, however, is there. We could think about each other. And that's why we're here. We're talking and thinking about Anishama, how that Anishama impacts each of us. Of course, a mother, but all of us as well. And above all, what are we going to do about it? That's how Jews think. We don't think, oy vey, what's going to be? What are we going to do about it? Action. Proactive action. Rabbi Lau, the former chief rabbi of Israel, chief rabbi of Tel Aviv today, told me this story. Personally, he said, when he came for the first time to the United States, it was 1974. It was right after the Yom Kippur War. And the Rebbe asked him in Yechidus, the Rebbe asked him, what's the mood in Israel? And I tell the story specifically because of the events going on now there as well. What's the mood in Israel? And he said to the Rebbe, the mood in Israel is not good. Jews are asking, what's going to be? Why? Because during the Six-Day War, which was just uh, seven years earlier, there was euphoria, the miracles in six days with very few casualties. I mean, every casualty is more than necessary, one more than enough, but relatively speaking, miracles. And there was such euphoria in the Jewish world. But here, by Yom Kippur War, mistakes were made. There was arrogance, cockiness. And the beginning was not good news. And then finally, thank God, the Jews turned it around. But there were more than a few thousand losses, which is a tremendous amount for a country like Eretz So he was telling the Rebbe, the mood is very bad. And people, Jews are asking, what's Vizayim? What's going to be? The way he tells the story is that the Rebbe grabbed his wrist, Lau's wrist, Rabbi Lau's wrist, like this, and said, Harav Lau, by Eden, Frek Munish was Vizayim, and Frek was Geitmenton. By Jews, we don't ask what will be, we ask what are we going to do. Not my yeah, my naseh. What are we going to do? A victim asks what will be. What will be means I can't do anything. Too bad. You wallow in self-pity. You're bitter, you're angry, or you're just plain apathetic or numb. But a Jew does never ask what will be. He asks, what am I going to do? Because that's a testimony that you have the power to do something. Sometimes it's difficult to do it alone. That's why we have friends. That's why we have support. That's why we have an aliyah in more ways than one. That's why you have that ability. But never forget, even though even though I myself can't do it alone, but at the end of the day, your friends empower you. They don't do it for you. They just help you help yourself. Because that's the great dignity of a human being, that you could get out of any situation. That's the ultimate blessing. And that's what the Rebbe told Rav Lau. And there are hundreds of such stories. There was a women's convention, in a midwinter convention in Detroit, Michigan. And Mrs. Swerdlov tells the story. So they were coming back after the convention. It was Friday. So they get to the airport, there's a snowstorm. So they write a note or they call on the phone and their note says, we're stuck in the snow. That's what everybody says, right? Stuck in the snow. You should see the Rebbe's answer when he said the word stuck. You don't write that to the Rebbe, stuck. The Rebbe circled the word stuck. He said he never heard Jews speak such language. He never stuck. And the Rebbe goes on to say that if you're there, it means there's a message. And the Rebbe continues, he says, the women at the convention probably talked about Ashgach and Pratis, divine providence, and they forgot to apply the message to themselves. That if there's a snowstorm, it means there's a message from heaven that you have to still be there. And it's even more so because it's a snowstorm. Where does snow fall from? From heaven. So it's a message from heaven. The Rebbe wrote writes that. That means that you still didn't finish your job. 
in Detroit, either at the airport or going back from the airport back to the city, and there's something you still have to do. And when you finish it, the snow will stop and you'll be able to come home. Anyway, they took that to heart and they did whatever they could do. Sunday, the snow stopped and they did come home. And the Rebbe wrote to them that now apparently that you can come back means you must have finished the job. I myself experienced this. My father, God forbid, had a, um, a stroke, a mini stroke, Rosh Hashanah Tov Shenun. That would be 89, 1989. And he had to be in the hospital, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Okay? I went by the Rebbe. The Rebbe wanted, wanted to give him lekach. So I came. The Rebbe gave me uh, the, the honey cake, Ervium Kippur, and said to me, give this to your father, as Alma Zisa Yark, sweet year. <coughs> and then the Rebbe added with a smile, and Zogem, as a farendik in sein schlich is dorten, but in the Maris laws, when he'll finish his mission in the hospital, they'll, they'll release him. So I went to the hospital, passed, carrying this message from the Rebbe, and my father, you know, of course, took it positively. My mother started running around doing mitzvahim in the whole hospital. My father said, I'm the one in the hospital. You're just visiting me. It's not your shlichus, it's my shlichus. I'll do it my way, not your way. And my father, whatever he did, he did his thing. Just to show you, it wasn't just a joke. After Yom Kippur, Rabbi Chadakov came to the hospital to see my father. And the Rebbe wants to know, he asked, whether you, fin- you already finished your mission. So you could already be released. So my father said, I hope so. <laughs> And he was released a few days later, thank God. Yeah. These are not just stories, nice, uh, humorous ones. They, they're an attitude to life. It's an attitude. There's no such thing as impossible. There's no such thing as inevitable. There's not language of Jews. Why is anyone, you, you know why Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year? Why is it the holiest day of the year? So most people say, okay, you know, God happened to choose the 10th of Tishrei. It could have been the 10th of Cheshvan or the 10th of Kislev. No, there's a reason. Because on that day, Moshe Rabbeinu did something that no human being in history ever did. You know what he did? He prevailed over God. The Jews built a golden calf. There, wasn't, there aren't many greater sins than building a, for an idol. You know, you, you have to die before you worship an idol. And here, the great Jewish people, did 39 days after receiving the Torah, the biggest event in history... What do they do? They build a golden calf. We'll analyze the reasons for that, but they did it. Moshe comes down from the mountain, and what does he do? He shatters the tablets and marches back on the, on the mountain and demands from God to forgive the people. I don't know if you know this, but you know why he shattered the tablets? Not because he got angry. Everyone thinks he was out of control. No, it was very deliberate. See, Moshe was the shatchan. He was the, the, the broker, the, the shatchan, the the matchmaker between God and the Jewish people. And the luchas is the contract. Is the luchas that say, lo As long as the Jews, here we have a lawyer in this town here, right, right now here, he came in perfect timing. As long as you didn't sign the contract or deliver it, you only heard lo They only heard the prohibition. They didn't sign it, they didn't receive it. So Mesha broke the luchas to be able to then say, you know what, I didn't give it to them. Can you imagine Mr. Snefesh of a Rebbe to do that? Give, to, to break the tablets. The tablets were not... When a Sefer Torah, God forbid, falls, by accident is considered a whole tragic day and you fast and all that. Here it's not just a Sefer Torah, it's the ultimate. It's the luchas that God himself formed and shaped and, and gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe doesn't do it by accident, deliberately breaks the luchas. Exactly what he said. Erase my name from your book if you're not going to forgive them. Never in history did anyone ever do anything like that. Such Mr. Snefesh. He didn't just give away his body, his soul. He's ready to, his whole future, his whole the spiritual future. The Rebbe once spoke a whole sikh on the Simchas Torah, 1986, crying like a child when the Rebbe spoke this sikh. But what did Moshe accomplish? So he went up on the mountain for 40 days, another 40 days, and was not successful. So then he went a third time 40 days. And when does he come down, Yom Kippur? And what do we say right after Kol Nidre? God said, I forgive, as you've said. Why? Because Moshe was able to accomplish something. God said, no, 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 no. And Moshe knocked down the door and would not take no for an answer. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. You know why? Because on that day, what was born was hope. Hope. Hope is the greatest gift in life. 
Because, like for example, someone says to you, God says, I want to offer you anything you want. Many people say, give me a perfect life. That's an immature request. That's not realistic. You want to say like this, that whatever happens in my life, I want to... Ha- whatever happens in my life, I want to have the hope to know that I can fix. That's a far greater blessing. That means there's nothing in the world that can destroy us. And look, at here we are, the Jewish people after thousands of years. Who would believe? So... The bottom line message is the following, that each of you, each of us, has unbelievable power. Despite the tragedy that what we're honoring here today, as I said, it's a sad moment, but at the end of the day, Jews take sadness, it's energy, it's negative energy, and we turn it into positive energy by becoming stronger, more committed, more committed to our own lives to sing your song. And yes, birth is God saying you matter. And you have a great Rebbe thinking about you. And you have friends that think about you. And as much as we think, we have to obviously in a night like this, make a commitment to think even more about each other. Because machshava me'elas, thought changes things. Don't ever underestimate that if you're sitting in a room and you think about somebody, even if not there, they're not there that moment, and you care, sincerely, it has an effect. And today, if you know a little quantum mechanics, it's not such a miracle either. Energy. Energy is exuded from us, like good vibes. You can't see them, but they have an effect. The butterfly effect, you ever hear of that? A butterfly flaps its wings in in Kansas City and it can create a typhoon in uh, Singapore. I don't know why those two places, but that's what they say. So that means you can flap your wings in your privacy of your own little place and have an effect on everybody around you. So tonight we think about Yossi. I've heard this together with his mother, family, friends, brother, that you should have the strength to fill the hollow, the emptiness. We say, Hamokim Yenachem, Hamokim. Why do we say Hamokim Yenachem? Because it's a space that's empty. So God becomes the space that fills that space. I remember when I was sitting in Shiva for my father, I don't remember anything that was said to me except one thing. Someone told me, I don't even know who. They said, when there's a death, when there's a loss, it's like a hole in your heart. It's like a hole in your living room. You keep falling into it until one day you learn to walk around it. It never goes away. The heart, the hole is there. But you learn to walk around it and you learn to build around it. So Hashem should bless you and all the friends and all of us here to use this cholo, to use this that sometimes when we don't see someone it makes the, the yearning and the pining and the aspiration much deeper. We don't take it for granted. And beyond that, all of you special souls, with all your own journey, your own twists and turns, to recognize that this is, entire existence is waiting for you to do something with your life in that place that you are right now, and wherever God will lead you, to change the world in some way. And we're here to join together in that way. You know, many people are involved with their superficial nonsense and Narish Kaitan. You know, I think a place like this has a certain, as I said with the story with the St. Louis woman, We don't always have, when things don't work exactly as planned, there's a certain truth that emerges. Like the truth of that woman, that you realize why the importance of life, you appreciate it, you know? When you see someone on a respirator and they can't breathe, you suddenly appreciate breathing a lot better than the rest of us that take it for granted. So let's use this evening well, make the right resolutions in our Thank you again, it's been an honor to share a few words. And Aliyah, Kishmai Kain Hu, it's an aliyah, we don't even use the word yirida, you just use aliyah. Because as the Rebbe explains, that even the descent is part of the ascent. When you build a great building, sometimes you have to raise the old building, right? Raise as in Z, R-A-Z-E. You have to lay. And if someone comes and says, hey, why are you breaking down this building? You'll say, I'm not breaking it down, I'm building a better base of English. So then the yirida, even the seser, even what seems to be for a moment a... Uh, a void or a negative is actually part of the positive because the only way to grow. <coughs> right. So may this aliyah be a true aliyah and as the neshama goes, it's aliyah every year. Amen. So it elevates also each of us in greater ways. Just uh, reminded me, I once read somewhere, a caterpillar, you know, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Right? The caterpillar goes into a chrysalis, into a cocoon. So the story is told, 
So it takes time once it goes into the cocoon. Then the cocoon begins to open like an egg begins to crack and the butterfly begins to emerge. So there was a guy saw a butterfly struggling to get out of the cocoon because the cocoon wasn't yet open. So he, out of his great compassion, you know what he did? He took a pair of scissors and began to cut the cocoon to let the butterfly out. And the butterfly suddenly up free and he was such a simcha. But one little small tra- uh, tragedy. For a butterfly to fly, it needs a certain, um, a certain uh, a buoyancy, a certain the type of lift. The wings need liquid in them. And how that liquid spreads into the wings is through the pressure of the butterfly struggling to get out of the cocoon. And his compassion, taking away the struggle from the, from the butterfly, did not allow the, the liquid to enter the wings so the butterfly never could fly. This tells you that how, what challenges are like. Challenges help us build wings that we can fly to places you can never reach on your own. So God should bless us all to understand our challenges are really wings. Fly to great places. Aliyah. Flight. Take flight. May your souls soar. And may the Nisham of Yossi help us all soar. May be reunited with Yossi, with the Rebbe, with all great Sadiqim, Achsidim, and all those of uh, parents or relatives or loved ones that are physically not here with us. And may, may, remember, let us think about them and they think about us and that Mechshava can pierce all the barriers. So thank you again. We should only have simchas and good occasions to Mr. Alexander and the whole Mishpacha and all of you here. Thank you. Amen. Amen.